Can someone confirm again by speaking? Sorry. Yes, sir. I'll take it. Okay. Mike, Mike. Microphone. I am audible to everyone, right? So can someone confirm? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so we can get started. I'm sharing my screen. One second. Let me just record a question. So effectively, we are done with the syllabus and everything, right? So uh, I hope you guys are, you know, catching up along the way. Uh, how's the preparation going like you two are attempting for September, right? So December. And what about you? I'm from April. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Case studies are here. Case studies. Besides reporting, has been. Great, great. So, um, let's just practice a few questions in relation to the case studies itself, uh, to finalize on things. And uh, yeah, that's it. So, I have a question over here. I'll just read the requirement first of all. And uh, those who are on the call, please turn your videos on as well at all times. <coughs> Keep it turned on as well. Uh, so the first thing that we will be looking at would be the requirement, first of all. Okay. This one says, for each of the two issues, discuss the issue, including an assessment of whether it is material, recommend procedures the audit team should undertake at the completion stage to try to resolve the issue, and describe the impact on the auditor's report if the issue remains un uh, unresolved. <clears throat> So this particular set of questions are for 12 marks, right? And there are two issues as well, so six marks each. Okay, that's basically how you should, you know, plan that particular issue. So that effectively means that for each of these points, you will have two marks each, like that. Okay, so split it that way. So now let's discuss what the issues are, okay? So you are an audit manager of Apple & Co, which is the audit firm. And you are currently reviewing the audit files for several of your clients for which the audit field work is complete. <clears throat> the audit seniors have raised the following issues. First of all, there's an uh, issue with Jasmine Design School. And the issue is that Jasmine's year-end is 30th September. However, subsequent to the year-end, the company's sales ledger has been corrupted by a computer virus. Jasmine's finance director was able to produce the financial statements prior to this occurring. However, the audit team has been unable to access the sales ledger to undertake 
PTU testing of revenue or year end receivables. All other accounting records are unaffected and there are no backups available for the sales ledger. Jasmine sales revenue is 5.6 million and its receivable balance is 3.4 million. Profit before tax is 3 million. So what is the issue here and how do we assess the issue here? <clears throat> what do you guys think? Is not available, that means the revenue may be overstated or understated. Hmm. So that's an audit risk, yes. Right. So what is the first thing that you have to do? Discuss the issue, including the assessment of whether it is material. Is it material? Yes. How do you mean? Because we are not sure of sales uh, figures. We're not sure of sales figures. Okay, how much is the sales figure? It is the estimate, right? The backup taken before it was corrected. Yeah. So we are not sure uh, the time loop uh, when the backup was taken and uh, how much sale would have proceeded in that interval. Well, what is the materiality? The like yeah. percentage of these, I guess right. we have to take, right? Mm -hmm. That was something I wanted to ask the time for. So tell me guys, like if sales is affected, would it have any impact in receivables as well? Yeah, if it's on credit, so yeah. So is the receivable balance material? Yeah. Like by how much? Yeah, how much? By what percent is it material should be the first thing that we need to calculate. So, yeah, you can just... 15.6 into 0.5%. Not exactly. Like 0.5% is the benchmark for the revenue figure. Yeah. So here, what we can do is like we can either compare the... Uh, there's no assets or anything to do with here, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, now my so you can compare this 3.4 million to either of these figures, 15.6 or 2 million, right? And uh, you know, mention that as to whether it is material or not. It's simply like show a percentage figure like that. Okay, that's the first thing that you have to do. Okay, so uh, yeah, so just calculate something like 3.4 divided by 15.6, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, that would give you a percentage figure. Okay. So it's around 21% of total revenue, right? That's in the receivable balance is around 21% of total revenue. Okay, so therefore it's definitely material. Right, we're sure of that. And secondly, yeah, like what else needs to be done? You have to recommend the audit team about certain completion stage procedures as well. So what can the audit team do? And then we have to write the substantial procedure of data saving. What all procedures can you write? Yes, Remember, this is the completion stage. Okay, so in the completion stage, I don't think we can write things like uh, obtain correspondence or anything. That's, that's good. So we can compare the figures with prior year balance. Mm -hmm. First, and multiple procedures can be conducted. Yes. So we can compare uh, for the guys and for. Uh, you can compare the current year figures with the prior year to see if there's any significant fluctuations or anything like that. That can definitely be done. What else? We need one more procedure. Yeah. Well, you said we cannot take the confirmation of the price, right? Yeah. CAAP, I guess, is what I'm saying, right? Yeah, you can you can have CAP procedures. 
So Jasmine seals are just have been corrupted by a computer virus. Therefore, no detailed testing has been performed on revenue and receivables. The audit team will need to see if they can confirm the uh, revenue and receivables in an alternative manner. If they are unable to do this, then two significant balances in the financial statements will not have been confirmed, right? And we have conducted an assessment over here, right? Revenue and receivables are both higher than the total profit for tax this group of two million, right? Receivable balance is 170% of PVP, right? Uh, probably for tax. And then revenue is nearly eight times of PVP as well. Okay. So definitely if there's a huge amount of misstatements. My next question would be this. What would the audit opinion be? Audit opinion. <clears throat> will it be qualified except for, would it be adverse opinion? Would it be... Qualified uh, except for because there's only one thing that we are unsure of all the values are okay. So you're yeah. saying that the situation is material yeah, but yeah, not yeah. pervasive. It is pervasive, it is pervasive. It is pervasive right? It is. it is pervasive. So guys, the situation is material and pervasive. <laughs> Why is it material? Because we just calculated that, right? As in we're saying that the receivable balance is 170% of prop uh, PBT. Okay. So if the entire receivable balance is misstated, it can actually convert a loss into a profit. True, right? So it is both material and pervasive as well. Okay, so if you calculate the materiality and if you find it as above 100%, then obviously it will be pervasive itself. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so what should the opinion be? Adverse opinion, right? Why? Because there's an accounting issue, right? Uh, there's no inability to obtain uh, such an appropriate audit evidence or anything over here. It is it is an accounting issue, right? And uh, it is a pervasive issue as well. Therefore, the opinion would be at worst. Okay, we will provide an at worst opinion. All right. So two procedures uh, that are suggested here is discuss with the management whether they have any alternative reports, which detailed revenue and receivable balances will be here. <laughs> and then perform analytical procedures. That. Right. So the auditors will need to modify the opinion as they are unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in relation to the two material and pervasive areas. The opinion paragraph will be a disclaimer opinion and will state that the audit auditor does not express an opinion in the financial statement. All right, it's disclaimer because we don't have any alternative. It makes sense. All right, so basically, the reason why it's a disclaimer here is because, like, if you look at this inference. Yeah, so we're asking the management for an alternative set of records, right? Right? And if they don't have it, then it will be a uh, inability to obtain such an appropriate evidence, not only the counting issue. So uh, that's basically why we're providing a disclaimer of it. Okay, my bad. Uh, so yeah, that's just it. And you see this one liner? This can be used in any type of questions. Like right? you just you just have to another disclaimer opinion, but you know, a basis of opinion paragraph will explain the limitations in uh, in relation to the lack of evidence or uh like why there was a mistake and why did we provide an adverse opinion right all these things will be mentioned within, within this particular paragraph so by adding this one line you know you'll get one additional mark so yeah all right so that's the issue of jasmine design school secondly lily enterprises <clears throat> Lily has experienced difficult trading conditions and as a result, it has lost significant market shares. The cash flow forecast has been reviewed during the audit field work and it shows a significant net cash outflow. Management are confident that further funding can be obtained and so have prepared the financial statement using the going concern basis with no additional disclosures. The audit senior is highly skeptical about this. So the prior year financial statement showed a profit before tax of 1.2 million. However, 
The current year loss before tax is 4.4 million and the forecast net cash outflow for the month for the next 12 months is 3.3 million as well. So based on this, like what is the issue? Going, going concern issue, right? There's a going concern issue. Why? Because we're expecting a huge net cash outflow. Net cash outflow basically means that uh, the cash outflow is more than the inflow, right? So, uh, and of course, in the current year, there's also a loss as well, right? So, considering all these aspects, there is a, you know, going concern issue, right? So, what would the auditor's impact be? Uh, so, there should be breakup based on the problem, not the going concern. Are we sure of that? We, we, we should assess it. Uh, we should assess what, uh, on what basis management has uh, prepared the accounts right. and evaluate it, analyze it, then we should... Uh, hmm. Right. So procedures are pretty clear, right? As in we need to discuss with management that, you know, on what basis are you saying that, uh, you know, there is no going concern issue on what basis are we preparing the financial statements on a going concern basis, right? That needs to be discussed. And other than that, like what we can do is we can explain like what the impact of the auditor's report would be, right? For example, as of now, there is an uncertainty within the going concern issue, right? This needs to be disclosed. If it's not adequately disclosed, then what would happen? If there are opinion of the auditor's report, right? If there, if there are adequate disclosures, then there would be an unmodified I'm opinion, of course, with an MURGC paragraph, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Right, EOMP is when it's prepared on a regular basis, I believe. So, yeah. And which way, so if there are no uh, adequate disclosures, if there are inadequate disclosures, then obviously it will be what? If there are inadequate disclosures, then we consider it to be material or pervasive again. You know. Exactly. If it's material but not pervasive, then qualified except for. But if it's material and pervasive, then adverse opinion. Yep, like that. That's basically how the flow is. So, uh, as of now in the situation, there's no definite answer as such, right? Because you know anything can go on. So you, you need to explain step by step. As in, uh, we'll say that hey, like as of now, there's an uncertainty, but that's not regarded over here. So check if there's adequate disclosures or not. If there are disclosures, unmodified opinion with the MURGC. If no disclosures, then is it material or pervasive, right? And then, you know, mention the opinions accordingly. So line by line, you'll have to explain what these steps should be. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so for questions like these, where they ask for an impact on the auditor's report, first thing that you have to mention is the materiality of the situation. Okay, if it can be calculated, then calculate that. Secondly, uh, you have to explain, if it's an accounting issue, then explain what the accounting issue is. If there's any other issue, then explain what the issue is, right? And then thirdly, like, how has the managed, if the management has done an accounting treatment, is it right or wrong? You can mention that, right? And then mention if the situation is material or pervasive and then, and, and then the opinion. What kind of opinion would, would it be? Would it be qualified except for opinion? Would it be adverse opinion? Would it be disclaimer opinion? Mention that, right? And finally, add a one-liner saying about saying that there will be a basis of opinion paragraph where we will explain the situation. Okay, so these five points needs to be there in all impact auditors impact questions. <clears throat> Clear? Right. And we'll just look for another. Thank you. 
I'll check that tonight. Most likely. Any question? <laughs> right. Is the screen visible to everyone? So let's read this particular requirement over here. Describe substantive procedures you would perform to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in relation to the above three matters. First matter is uh, regarding supplier statement reconciliations. Yeah. Cromwell receives monthly statements from its main suppliers. And although these have been retained, none have been reconciled to the payables ledger as at 31st March 2005. The engagement partner has asked the audit senior to recommend the procedure to be performed for supplier statements. So, three marks available. Three procedures needs to be written. What kind of audit procedures can we write for supply chain? Yeah. We have uh, we can confirm uh, we can share the confirmation letter for the suppliers and confirm the outstanding balance and ask them to share the statement. <laughs> Obtain. Corresponding basically as in uh, the confirmation letters from suppliers, right? That's a procedure. How would you write your food? Take some time, I would say, take let's say five minutes and then write down three procedures, okay? <laughs> Remember, guys, like when writing the procedures, three things need to be there, right? The action work the source document, as well as the objective, as in why you're writing that. So, yeah. Is it done? Is it done, everyone? Those who are turned off their videos. <clears throat> you guys need more time? Like, are you guys done? What is C means by the by the C? C. All right, so we can start the briefing then. Uh, you guys can do it. So, one was obtained confirmation letter from suppliers stating year of year and balances. And supply sample, pick a sample. Yeah, right. That you're right. Otherwise, you'll consider the 
procedure to be Pick a supplier on yeah. sample basis and then obtain a confirmation letter from yeah. that supplier. Yeah. And that uh, letter should be uh, directed to uh, received directly to auditor. Yeah, that's in July, but yeah. Then observe aging payable in account. Uh, I don't know what else to write, but aging payables. Payables, aging. Yeah, that uh, how much, uh, because amount will be there. We have not paid that debt for a long period of time. Maybe these kind of conditions is that. So why has that not been paid? But... How does that help in budget? Well, that seems like a business issue, right? So, no, so there will be outstanding balance in liability side, which is not relevant. Which can be there, as in, you know, there can be outstanding liabilities. That's not a problem for the artist, right? But, you know, our problem is that, you know, is the payables balance, like, accurate? Is it is it understated? That's the that's an issue for this. So, on that basis, you have to see. And what I have read did to compare prior year supplier balance to the current year. Current year. That's like a see analytical procedures are like a last resort. I would say if you don't get anything, then you can write analytical procedures. So that's basically how it can be done. Other than that, is there any other procedure? You can also check for the presentation of what I have been done for because sometimes supplier balance has pre been in the world. Accruals. But you're not speaking from a you know reconciliation standpoint. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, we can like compare the payable ledger with the purchase balances, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's the thing, right? That's the specific. That's a very specific, uh, you know, procedure over here. This, you know, as for the scenario, they're not doing the supplier statement reconciliation, right? And what do we do in supplier statement reconciliation? Basically, we compare the payables balance with, uh, what was it? Yeah, this monthly statement suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we compare the supplier statements with the payables ledger, right? This is what we do. Right to see if everything is matching or not. Right, if there are any differences, we look into it. Right, this is not done. Right, so what we have to do is like as Angita says, we will you know compare some of these balances, payable balances, to the supplier statement to see if it actually agrees with it. on a sample basis again. Okay, uh, and what else? That's one procedure. What else? Maybe we can also substantiate the balance. With the help of copy of invoices. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. For a sample of balances, what we can do is we can look for its supporting documentation, right? As yes. in, you know, uh, like the invoices or something like that to see. That's a detailed procedure. That's a detailed procedure. Yeah, we can write that. So to confirm the balances, right? So eventually we can write that to a certain extent. Yeah. But other than that, <laughs> Think of it from a supply statement reconciliation standpoint. Like, what could pose a difference? Any ideas? Exceptions. Are you you are you are exceptions. Are you yeah. See, there are two situations that I can think of which could give rise to a reconciliation difference. Right? One, One yeah, is dispatched, but not the same. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Goods in transit or cash in transit, basically, right? So we could look for these situations. Like, is there any balances where, uh, you know, the goods are in transit? Or is there any balances where the cash is in transit, right? Do I, there should be something in the answer regarding this. Yeah. So where difference occur due to invoice in transit, confirm goods received notes, whether the Confirm from the goods received notes whether the receipt of goods was pre hearing. If so, then if so, confirm that this receipt is included in the year and envelopes. Right? If we have received the goods, then effectively we should be recording it. Right? So has it been recorded? That's basically what we're trying to do here. And the same for cash in transit as well. Uh, whether the differences occur due to cash in transit from Cornwall to the supplier. 
confirm from the cash books and bank statement that the cash was spent pre year end. Okay, because if it's pre year end, then we can record it for the current year, but else it should be recorded in the next year. Okay, it's basically the idea. So, this is how you think from a scenario's perspective itself, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> What else? Bank reconciliation. During last year's audit of Cromwell's bank and cash, significant cutoff errors were discovered from, uh, with the number of post year end checks being processed prior to the year to reduce payables. The finance director has assured the audit engagement partner that this error has, has not occurred again this year and that the bank reconciliation has been carefully prepared. The audit engagement partner has asked the bank reconciliation is comprehensively comprehensively audited. So four marks are available here and you need to write four procedures. Again, bank reconciliation, right? So think of it from that perspective. First to check whether the checks have been cleared or not. To remove the so account table balance. <clears throat> so they're not saying that the bank reconciliation is not conducted. They're saying that it has been conducted, but there were a few issues, right? So of course we can obtain the bank reconciliation first of all, cast to agree, check for additions to ensure arithmetical accuracy. Right? Simply recalculate, simple as that. Okay. Secondly, agree the balance as for the bank reconciliation to the original year end bank statement and to the bank confirmation letter to verify the balances, right? So if they have done a reconciliation, what are we doing? We're taking that reconciliation, we're recalculating it once, right? And then now we're checking that, uh, are the balances accurate? Are the cash balance as per our books and the balance as per the bank statement correct or not, right? That's the second step, right? Right? So there are simple procedures that you could think of whenever a situation comes. So yeah, this is just an example. And then agree the balance, the cancellation balance as per cash book to the year in cash book. So what am I doing here? I'm agreeing the balance as per bank statement and the balance as per uh, cash book within the reconciliation to the actual reports. Okay. Okay. And finally, trace all the outstanding loadments to the pre-year end cash book. I guess this is something that you would have read when you went through that you know, substantive procedure, right? What are outstanding loadments in India? Is this procedure complete? What do you guys think? Which procedure? Last one. Or even the second last one, I would say. Have you ever mentioned like why we are doing any of these procedures? To ensure the financial statements are shown to improve everything. That's that would be much of a generic objective, but uh, let's say this particular procedure, right? Agree the reconciliation balance as per the uh, cash book to the bank to the year in the cash book, right? So we are mentioning the action, we are mentioning the source document. But is the objective mentioned? No, right? Bank needs to be added, okay? Okay. So, like some of these procedures are taken from your exam kits itself, which is why some of them are incomplete. So, ideally, like in your exam, you should mention why are we doing this? Like over here, we're just verifying the accuracy of the uh, cash book balances, right? And the second one, we're confirming the accuracy of the uh, balance as per bank statement, right? So all these things need to be mentioned at all. The objective needs to be mentioned basically. Now coming back, trace all outstanding loadsmen. Outstanding loadsmen are like you have presented the checks, but it's not processed yet. Okay, that's basically the idea. So we trace the pre-year in cash book and the post-year in bank statement, and also to the pay in paying in book pre-year in. Paying in book pre-year in trace. So basically, we're just seeing if you know these these checks has been cleared eventually, like post year end, right? Uh, 
like has it been cleared or not post year end and then like if not then it shouldn't be accounted for right so that's basically the idea yep okay simple <clears throat> as that Yeah. Another situation is Cromwell's <laughs> Cromwell's receivables ledger has increased considerably during the year, and the year in balance is 2.3 million compared to 1.4 million last year. The finance director of Cromwell has requested that a receivable circularization is not carried out as a number of their customers complained last year about the inconvenience involved in responding. The engagement partner has agreed to this request and tasked you with identifying alternative procedures to confirm the existence and evaluation of receivables. So here there's a particular assertion that we have to you know, focus on, which is existence and valuation, right? So you have to write five procedures in relation to that. Any ideas? And of course, you cannot write correspondence or circularization. Uh, in the stable balances, there's a fictitious customer probability is that uh, because sales has rise, risen like two mm. times, I would say, mm. approximately. So there might be a fictitious uh, customers they have created during the year. Take your time, thank you. So can we compare the re uh, receivable balance with sales and see like if the accurate amount of receivables is there or not? Can you repeat that? Can you so Receivable balances with sales and allowances for receivables is there or not? Receivable balance with? Sales. Sales. As in... You're saying conduct a correlation analysis or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. And and one one more is there like uh if we can see uh, like allowances for receivables are I accurate or not? Like if they have created any provisions for the same. Repeat that one again. Sorry, please come again. Uh, can you repeat that once again? So, like, if we have like provision or allowances for the receivables, like, if it is there, like, because like they can uh, manipulate the receivable balances as well, because uh, there might be some receivables who, who, who like, consider as bad that so we have like particular allowances for that or not. Yeah, allowance for receivables can be there, yes. What do you want to do with that? 
to see like if they have created it appropriately or not something like that. But that would be judgmental though, as in you know the company can say that five percent of the receivables would be bad debt, and we can't like question it as such. I would say could be a part of their policy. So. this investigate age receivables raised during the year or the invoice uh, uh, raised during the year and validate with GDA, with yeah. yeah, that can be done. Then it's on a sample basis, of course, but yeah, that can be done. Like overall, see, those are, yeah, like an analytical procedure that you can do is like you can calculate the receivable days or something, right? Or, or age receivables for that matter and then compare it to the prior year to see if you know, there's any significant fluctuations or anything like that, right? That can be done. And for a, fam a sample of, let's say, receivables, you can compare it to the goods dispatching or something like that. Goods dispatching. Mm -hmm. No, dispatching. Yeah. Goods dispatching to see if, like, they are actually, you know, uh, like a receivable balance should actually be there. As in, is, is there a, you know, like, are we liable to receive money, right? So we can check that out. So. Mm -hmm. I would I not check that. Yeah. No, no. As in check, check the, the post year post year in bank balance in which we have received that age amount. Review. Post year review. review. Post I was not sure what to replace it with. Yeah. Review post year in bank balance. Yeah. Yeah. Post year in bank Uh, that's actually a good procedure as well. Like we can review the post year end, uh, you know, cash receipts, a sample of cash receipts to see if you know uh, they've actually been received or not. So yeah, we would have seen some similar procedures in that example. That's all. Right. Okay. Yeah, that basically covers it. I'll just read out the answers once. So, yeah. We can review the age receivables ledger to identify any slow moving or old receivable balance. Discuss the status of these balance with the credit controller to assess whether they are likely to be paid or not. Because there is a risk that there might be, uh, you know, bad debts or something hidden, right? So we can, you know, have a look at the age receivables ledger to identify those to a certain extent. Yeah. Secondly, uh, we can review correspondence to identify any like. We're talking about the ones that are already been sent out. Okay, not like we're not sending out new ones, right? For the ones that's already sent out, you can see if there's anything that's likely in dispute or something like that, right? Uh, <coughs> we can calculate the average receivable days and compare it to the prior year for investigating any significant different differences, right? Again, valuation assertion is, uh, you know, used over here. Inspect post year in sales return or credit notes and consider whether an additional allowance against receivables is required, right? So this is a different one as an in, instead of looking into which dispatch note or anything, like what we can do is like, if there was any goods returned, right? Like, are those adjusted for, or not? right? That's basically what we're trying to verify here, okay? And finally, select a sample of which dispatch move before and just after year end and follow through to the receivables ledger to ensure that they are recorded in the correct period as well. Okay. There are two assertions being tested here. One is cutoff and second is valuation. Like is the we're also checking if the current year receivable balance is valued appropriately as well, right? So that's also there.
clear? Any questions in any of these? Right. Extra question. Uh, is it possible that you can write uh, that any error might have been occurred while we are typing and we reduced means 20,000 became 2 lakhs? Is it possible to be can write? In then that kind of situation will be there. I would think so. All right, so a few more things about substantive procedures. So like in your exam, like sometimes you may have to write substantive procedures based on, let's say, some, let's say some difficult terms, right? For example, we've learned about, uh, let's say, depreciation or amortization for that matter, but the questions might be on, let's say, payroll or something like that, or it could be on year and tax liability, right? So when questions like those come up, like what you can do is you can break down that calculation. Okay, see if it's depreciation, then there could be five or six procedures that would need to be written, right? So what you can do is just think think of breaking down that calculation. What is the depreciation calculation? Cost minus residual value divided by useful life, right? So for each of these items, you can do maybe a, you know, maybe a procedure, right? For costs, to verify that the cost is accurate, you can confirm it with the supporting documentation. Let's say invoice, let's say title deeds or any other agreements for that matter, right? For residual value, like that would be a calculation on its own, right? As in we're converting uh, something in like, yeah, there would that would be a future value, present value calculation. So we can again obtain that calculation, recalculate it, or we can discuss certain assumptions with the management, right? Same goes for useful life, you can, you know, uh, confirm that as, as in why exactly are you using this particular useful life, uh, you know, instead of others, right? So all these things can be done. So whenever a particular, uh, you know, the calculation or something comes up in the exam, just break it down and then test each and every aspect of that calculation. Okay. If it's payroll, then you can like break down that calculation like uh, for payroll, like they would be calculating it based on something like this, as in there would be the number of hours worked, right? And you multiply that hours with the wage rate or like salary rate or whatever it is, right? So if it's salaried employee, then there would be, let's say, a contract of employment, right? So think of these documentations and everything like that. Break down the calculation and then think of the supporting documentation. Yep. That's one way of writing a substantive procedure, an easy way of writing a substantive procedure. And again, ensure three things. The three things should always be there. You should always write what needs to be done and why are we doing it, right? So the action work, so uh, <clears throat> source document as well as objective or assertion should always be there. Okay, clear? Okay. What else? Now I think we should also do the... Have we done a control deficiency question before? So here you have a question um, in respect of the payroll system of Nalinda Co. <clears throat> Identify and explain five deficiencies. Recommend a control to address each of these deficiencies. And then describe a test of control as well. Yep. So it's one mark for each of these eight points, A, B, and C. So I'll read out this particular uh, scenario. You guys tell me if there's a control deficiency there, okay? Melinda Co. operates a chain of hotels across the country. Melinda employs in excess of 250 permanent employees. <coughs> and its year end is 31st August, 2004. You are the audit supervisor of Santa and Co. And are currently reviewing the documentation of Melinda's payroll system. 
detail below in preparation of the audit internal model system. So we have the payroll system we given over here. Permanent employees work a standard number of hours per week as specified in their con uh, employment contract. However, when the hotels are busy, staffs can be requested by management to work additional shifts as overtime. This can either be paid on a monthly basis or taken as days off. Employee records employees record any overtime work and days off uh, days taken off on weekly overtime sheets, which are sent to the payroll department. The standard hours per employee are automatically set up in the system, and the overtime sheets are entered by clerks into the payroll package, <coughs> which automatically calculates the gross and net pay along with the relevant deductions. These Calculations are not checked at all. Wages are increased at the by the rate of inflation each year, and the clerks are responsible for updating the standing data in the payroll system. Employees are paid on a monthly basis by bank transfer for their contracted weekly hours and for any overtime worked in the previous month. If employees choose to be paid for overtime, Authorization is required by department heads for any overtime in excess of 30% of standard hours. If employees choose instead to take days off, the payroll clerks should check back to the overtime work report. However, this report is not always checked. The overtime work report, which details any overtime recorded by the employees, is run by the payroll department weekly and emailed to department's heads for authorization. The payroll department asks department heads to only report if there are any errors recorded. Depart department heads are required to arrange for overtime sheets to be authorized by an alternative responsible official if they are away on annual leave. However, there are instances where this arrangement has not occurred. The payroll package produces a list of payments per employee this links into the bank system to produce a list of automatic payments. The finance director reviews the total list of bank transfers and compares this to the total amount to be paid per payroll reports. If any issue arises, then the automatic bank transfer can be manually changed by the finance director. So, throughout, like, have you guys noted any issues as such? Um, the manually adding numbers. Payroll clerks should check back the overtime work report. Mm -hmm. However, this report is not always checked. Okay. So you identified the issue. Now you have to explain the impact of that issue. If it is not uh, checked, there might be over or under payment done for the for any of the hours. Because maybe there was because Okay, if some employees comes and say, I want to take off, if he's not checking if he has done the work or not, there will be like uh, extra day off for him, right? right so exactly. it's the impact. Uh, I don't know how it will impact, but day off should not be given to the employee also. Mm -hmm. So, this is like so there is a or... risk that, or there is a potential impact that, like, if this particular overtime work report is not always checked, then some employee can take unnecessary leaves, and unnecessary leaves can impact the business, right? So, here we are not talking about, or when we are writing control deficiencies, okay? We are not talking about uh, what the impact on the financial statement is, or what, what the financial impact would be. Okay. We're talking about how it would impact the business. Okay. Because why are controls there? Controls are there to prevent the uh you know prevent unnecessary errors or fallen activities from happening in the business, right? So we have to think from the perspective of a business here when talking about control deficiencies. Okay. So as you said, you know, there would be uh like if it's like if they are claiming let's say overtime payment, then there would be unnecessary payments. Mm -hmm. But if they're taking time off, again, there would be unnecessary mm -hmm. time taken off by the employees. Okay, that would be the impact. Now, uh, so that's the first step. You have to identify the issue, identify the control deficiency, and explain the impact on the business. Okay, okay. Now, secondly, 
uh, you have to recommend the control as well. That uh, one of the superior or maybe this clerk only uh, should check the overtime work sheet. Right. Right. Ideally, basis. see what is the what is the issue here? The issue is that uh, overtime work report is not set before uh, a leave is authorized, right? So, of course, the recommendation would be check that particular report. Simple, okay? It should be checked by a responsible official. Always use the word responsible official, okay? Because sometimes, see, hierarchy is different in different organizations, okay? We definitely know that, uh, you know, a clerk is like a lower level than a manager is on another level, but... You know, we, like in order to avoid any confusion, what we can do is we can always use the word senior official or responsible official for that matter. Okay. So yeah, that would be my control recommendation, right? So an authorized official or a senior responsible official should be verifying as to whether, uh, or, or they should be checking the overtime work report to see if uh, the particular employee is actually eligible to take a time off or not, right? This is the control recommendation. How do we test the control as an auditor? As an auditor. Test of control also needs to be mentioned, right? We can also ensure that we are checking on, on the overtime worksheet. How? We can also like compare the or the worksheet with the amount we have paid to the particular person. Like we can do it on the sample basis. Okay, so we can also check, what was it? Sorry. <clears throat> we can also compare like the over uh, that particular sheet with the amount payable to the uh, particular employee. Like we can do it on sample basis, oh. like if that is correct or not. But here it's not about amount paid, it's more about the employees taking these, right? So, uh, slight correction. Uh, it says that, uh, you know, for a sample of, employees who have taken a holiday or something, we can, again, refer back to the overtime report to see if they have actually worked overtime and they are claiming it to be okay. So that can be a check that the auditor can do. Okay. All right? Clear. Yeah. Okay. So that's one issue to solve. Any other issues that you guys noted? Manually adding the numbers. Hmm? Manually adding the numbers. Uh, which is that? Uh, that it was mentioned in the clerk uh, itself my uh, added those numbers and when we read this I think I read it on the last paragraph where financial controller was editing the menu maybe there. No, I think it's in the starting. I think so. Was it this one, Ankita, or was it something else? No, no, so it, I think it is in the first or second paragraph. Okay. Okay. Over time, it's a return into the payroll package, which automatically mm -hmm. These calculations are not checked at all. So, well, this is an issue. The 
that uh, the same issue that you have mentioned when the highlighting panel in the blue it was mentioned that uh, that the sheets are entered by the clerk into the payroll packages that one okay this one all right so uh yeah this is also a deficiency like earlier like for this instance it, the issue was in relation to the taking the times off right but over here it's a bit more serious issue which would have a financial impact as well right because they are the clerks are you know uh the issue is that it's not checked it's not because the clerks are doing it right it's, but ideally it should be you know reviewed or authorized by someone of a senior designation right so that's basically the uh another deficiency that you can mention okay the calculation which is you know entered into the payroll package or the gross and net pay along with relevant deductions needs to be checked by someone checked by a senior official otherwise what would happen what is the impact of this particular issue the impact is that the company may be making unnecessary payments to you know the, their employees right or incorrect payments for that matter right which can affect staff morale and whatnot right so that's basically one thing secondly the uh, controlled recommendation what should we recommend that yeah someone of a senior designation should be reviewing this right before uh you know uh paying out i would say and what should be the test of control we, we should also uh, check what is the deductions and uh, what was the r r uh, work our work was there and what should be the deduction has that been correct, mm. correctly taken out we can and we can also see like the calculation is done appropriately or not. Okay, but the much more easier way to do this is by looking for the authorization itself, right? As in, if someone has reviewed, there would be certain like sign offs or something that would be there, right? So we can simply look for that. Okay, okay, that's an easy way to mention the test of control. <clears throat> Any other issues? Uh, plus, wages are increased increased by rate of inflation each year, and the clerk are responsible for updating the span spending data Spend. in the payroll system. So he might misstate or maybe error, error might happen with uh, when he's entering the data. Right. Exactly. Maybe the 30 percent calculation, what, whatever, sorry, the inflation rate he has not taken correctly. Hmm. Wrong. So changes to the standing data is made by a clerk, right? And again, this is not authorized by anyone, right? So that's again a deficiency. Again, the control recommendation should be that ideally clubs should not be the ones who should be making this change. And even if they are, like it should be authorized by a senior responsible official, isn't it? Test of control is again to see if like to see test of control is something that we can do is we can like have a look at who will have made the change into that particular standing data and see if that person is authorized or not. Simplest that. Okay. Anything else? The payroll department asks department heads to only report if there is any error. So. Hmm. There might be a deficiency because how do you analyze? Maybe we are uh, not checking of any errors. There is a risk that the payroll department may not check at all. I was in for or the uh, departmental heads may not conduct the check at all, and they just simply see that uh, you know there are no errors or something like that, right? So that can again lead to unnecessary payments and unnecessary you know uh, issues within the process. So. What should be done? What should be the control recommendation? But they should check the uh, all. They should check all the payroll uh, weekly sent to them, hmm. not only when errors recorded were sent. Right, all right. The, like, the... so they should be responding with uh, by saying that. Oh, ideally, the department uh, department heads 
should be record like should be responding uh you know by saying that hey our review is done and there is no error like even if even if there is no error you know they should be responding right that that's basically the control recommendation okay and as a test of control we can just inquire with the team to see if you know they are actually responding on this there would be email communications as well maybe we can check that out okay mm -hmm. There are multiple others. Yeah. The last paragraph has many layers, I would say. The payroll package produces a list of payments for employees, and the links automatically make the payments through banks. So if there is an error, the financial director would make manual changes to the hmm. amount, right? Hmm. So I think there is a deficiency. Why is it deficiency? Um, because he's making manual changes and it, manual changes. The finance are... director is making manual changes before these payments are sent out, right? So what would the impact be? Wrong payments. Means under overpayments. Yeah, I, <laughs> I thought yes. No, I mean, like, I don't think so. There is any deficiency because I think he's overlooking if all the things are correct or not. Like I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. See, you're partially right because, uh, like, in some companies, of course, finance directors do this, but. Ideally, finance director should not be a position, you know, who, who should be doing this, right? As in, see, payroll is processed by the payroll department. So, uh, you know, then that would give rise to a question like, why would a finance director be involved in the payroll, uh, you know, process by the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. It could be that, like, see, something that could happen is basically this, you know, in some companies like C CFOs or let's say finance directors, what these guys could do is they could... Maybe create a fictitious bank account and then you know send some money over company funds to over that particular bank account. That's that's a red flag, right? So all these kinds of things can happen. Okay, so that is a risk, and therefore you know ideally this should not be the case. As in, uh, the risk is that let's see if I have it. This process does not prevent employees to be omitted from the payroll. There is a there is equally a risk of fictitious employees or employees who have left the company appearing on the payroll. Okay. Okay. The finance director may update the banking details to his own bank account and say that hey, this particular employee is still active, mm -hmm. right? Even though they have resigned. Right? That's a possibility, right? So this can lead to unnecessary fraudulent payments, you know, paid by the company to the finance director itself, right? So that's a deficiency. Okay. Control recommendation, what it, what should it be? <clears throat> the one stated here is the finance director should agree a sample of the employees on the payroll records to the payment list and vice versa to ensure that the payments are complete and made only to bona fide employees, as in, you know, employees that actually exist. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's so one thing. Recommend it like that. Finance director should not and manually edit it, but he should liaise with the particular payroll team and right. ask them to make the changes, then come back with the amended report. Exactly. Yeah, you can say that. And what should the test of control be then? Test of control is easy, I would say, in this instance, right? And then we can just simply take a sample of the payments to be made and then... And bank you know, transfer details and can be checked by well, us. Well, see, auditors, like, there are a few restrictions when it comes to Personal employee reports, right. right? So, bank record, see, bank details and stuff like that. As in, we could get our hands on it, yes, but the problem is that... Uh, you know, for documentation purposes, what we do is we redact such information. Okay, redact in the sense we black out that information from certain records. So just to just for your reference, okay. So we can, uh, of course, for a sample of employees, check the verify the records to see if those employees actually exist or not, right? To look for potential fictitious employees, maybe, right? 
So that can be done as a test of control over here. Yeah. Anything else? I think we covered almost all of them. Yeah, like whenever the department heads are on leave, they should like assign a responsible person yeah. Yeah. who should review or authorize the worksheets, the overtime sheets. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are no such arrangement. If uh, he's on leave, then who will take care of the work? Right, exactly, right? So uh, the department of heads, if they're on leaves, ideally they should have, they should hire, hire an alternative responsible official, but that's not being done. Okay, that's also control deficiency. Okay, so ideally that should not be the case. Like control recommendation is simple, right? The, the problem was that there is no alternative person. So the solution is hire an alternative person or, you know, ensure that there is an alternative team who would be, uh, you know, responsible for doing this. Okay, simple as that. And as a test of control, we can inquire with certain, uh, you know, team members to see like what the process is, as in, would there be, let's say someone from HR or someone who would be taking the place of these departmental heads or something else, some other arrangement. So, yeah. All right. So yeah, that would be all. So overall, it's like the structure is something that you have to keep in mind, right? When mentioning the deficiency, identify the deficiency from the scenario, right? and then explain the impact of that deficiency on the company, okay, on the client, basically, right? For control recommendation, it entirely depends on the issue that you're identifying, right, simple solution. And for test of controls, if nothing comes to mind, think of wire code at the very least, okay. Okay. All right. And for audit risk questions, you guys know, right? For audit risk questions, identify the audit risk, explain as to what that risk is, and explain the impact on the financial statements. Okay. As a response, response will depend upon, you know, the situation itself. But as a last resort, if you don't get anything else, write something like maintain professional skepticism or, you know, discuss with the management about something. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, have we covered everything? Audit risk, efficiency, substantive procedure, and uh, impact on the report. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Basically. Any other questions? Top topic wise or any other unique questions for that matter? This is the final session, so yeah, you can let me know if there's any other questions as such. Oh, and even for the December people, like uh, you know, if you have any questions down the line, feel free to reach out to me, okay? Okay, if you're attending, you can do it right now. All right, so if you are attending, go papers at the time. First of all, make sure that you have sufficient time to do that, as in, you know, like there should be a bare minimum of three months. That should be like the bare minimum, right? Uh, and like, if you are attending sessions, just attend sessions with one of them, okay? As in, for example, as of now, you are attending AA, right? So for December, you can attend one more session, right? But attending two sessions and then preparing for two paper would be a bit difficult. Okay, that's basically why I'm saying that. So, uh, again, structure is the same. You cover the syllables, you practice the questions, and then you attend mock exam. That's basically the same structure itself. But is it just that you need to have a plan. And you need to you need to stick to that particular plan itself. Okay. Like, you know, sometimes what happens is like we may plan on doing the preparation at the end or maybe the last few like days or weeks, right? But uh, for two papers, that's like really impractical. It's not possible, right? So again, the key to any paper is the time that you devote for question practice itself. So ensure that you are devoting sufficient amount of time to practice those questions, to sit down and, you know, learn how questions are tackled, etc. So, yeah, if you can devote that much amount of time, then you are even three papers. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, if there's nothing else, then I have a word for you. Uh, do one thing, like, 
for those on call, uh, yeah, for any of you guys as well, just uh, give me a feedback of the overall session. And if you have any, you know, improvement points or something like that, then, uh, you know, just mention that. that was it. Take a few minutes and do this activity too. Before you, you know, I know that you won't do this after going out of the call. So, yeah, before you go out of this call, just, uh, you know, send me that, I would say. Uh, sir, I have a question. Like, as we are going to appear in December attempt, so if we do like any of the mock tests in between, so can we share it to you for checking? Yeah, sure, totally. Yeah, like you can do it that mock, mock exam and then send it to me. No worries. You can do that. I would say when I was attending your sessions, I was brainstorming all the time, so it really helped me. I was saying okay. that to others as well. That I think this uh, really helped because before uh, we get to the point, I think you smartly entangled all the things while we were on, on in the beginning of the session, like uh, going concern thing. Mm -hmm. when I was, Going through the lecture, I was like, we have already discussed it. There's nothing else we have to cover. Right, so right. smartly yeah. got corrected like yeah. that. Yeah. Very strong. Okay. Well, you guys take your time and then, you know, What's up, me like any other important points or something? We have to write it for you? Yeah. Oh. This for all the sessions for your self improvement? <laughs> for self improvement as well, yeah. <laughs> It could be anything, right? For example, like it could be about class timings as well. It could be about, uh, you know, the technical team support. It could be like infrastructure. It could be anything, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Both of you have sent, right? Yeah. It surprises me that you guys are taking this long. So. <laughs> okay. What I just want to add, like, the sessions that we had was, like, very interactive. It is not the one way of communication that, <laughs> that generally when the lecturer has. But yes, it is a two-way communication. We interacted a lot. So that helped to understand our the topics in more more better way rather than the theoretical aspect, but uh, looking the things from the pro, uh, practical perspective. Like you also ensure that whatever the uh, discussion that we are making, we have the live live example, like you shared the annual report, so that we can better relate. So that was very very good way of like uh, helping us understand the end to end perspective. Great. Thank you for telling that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Ankita and Goshen is like turning off their video and they're just writing a paragraph for me. So I'm can... done. Sir. Oh, you're done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sure. 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 Uh, all right. I'll have a look. All right. All right, then, guys. Uh, you know, I guess we can wind up the session, and uh, you know, I wish you all the very best for your upcoming exams. Prepare well, devote as much time as possible, especially for working professionals. And uh, for any other questions or queries, I'm always available. Feel free to reach out again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, much, sir. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Bye.